Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Our next guest is a publisher of a popular news website, Sahara Reporters. However, he has decided to put his days of journalism behind him by throwing his heart into Nigeria's political ring. As he gets up to run for the office of the president in Nigeria's forthcoming elections, many are wondering if he'll bring back his fiery brand of political activism, stretching all the way from his days as a student of the University of Lagos. Here to discuss his presidential bid in the 2019 general election, his plans for Nigeria, and how he has handled the string of controversies that have traded his news platform, Sahara Reporters, is Omoyele Shuwure. Shuwure, welcome to the morning show. Thank you for bringing me. Good morning, me. sir. Yeah, well, Thank I mean, you for joining us. Thank you. Quite a long jump. I mean, you, yeah. you built a reputation as an activist, yes. both as a student union leader and as, uh, you know, the founder of Sahara Reporters. Yes. Now you want to be president. That's correct. Some people are saying, it would have been better if you stayed as an activist. Why do you want to be president? Well, uh, you can stay an active, as an activist if you decide to limit how far you want things to change. Uh, but you can decide to be president if you want to take activism to the office of the president. And we've seen that happen both in South Africa and also in the U.S. where Obama uh, was a community activist, organizer. I think a level that is lower than mine as at the time he came out, even though he had a degree in law and had been well known, but he hadn't done as much as I had done uh, spanning 29 years when he became the president of the U.S. I'm talking about Obama now. So we've seen that all over the world where activists take a step higher or further, you know, to become president of their country because they are no longer satisfied with just being activists, which is, you know, you go to a protest and after you shouted and you are detained or tear gas to go back home and things remain the same. But you can, take a, you can make a decision to change things completely forever by going to that office where you can influence everything that needs to be influenced and make the changes that you need in a country that is very desirous of uh, the kind of revolutionary change that we need as we do today in Nigeria. Well, some people are saying, you know, uh, now that you have become a politician, that the integrity of your news platform, Sahara Reporters, could be compromised. Because no. anything you write, they will say, oh, you are partisan, you are politically biased. I, so, I mean, you, you were considered independent before. Don't no, you think you've eroded I, that I, independence? I've never been considered independent. Mm. Uh, and you know this, you used to be a spokesperson to the president. Sahara Reporters has always been considered to be, in some form, partisan, you know. Uh, but the partisanship is usually coming from the way we take the system on. And I think the partnership has been on the side of the truth all the time. And independence of Sahara reporters is going to remain the same way as it used to be. And But I know that for political expediency, a lot of people were accused Sahara reporters of all kinds. So like it's always been accused of for the last 12 years that uh, that existed. So I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about how we take Nigeria to the next level uh, that can guarantee prosperity, uh, progress, and uh, peace and development. Okay, you want to take Nigeria to the next level, that's correct? Right. Okay. I mean, well, <laughs> a level that's never existed before. Because okay. if you say next level, honestly, have yes. we ever been at a level that we can consider a level? Right. But your slogan is that you are leading a take back Nigeria movement. Take it back. Where are you taking Nigeria back from? Where are, uh, where are you taking it to? Yeah, we're taking Nigeria back from the people who have failed Nigeria over the last 58 years. We want to take Nigeria back from the doldrum and the oblivion into which it has been taken and taking it to a level that has never been to before, but you have to recoup it first. If something has been stolen from you and you want to take it, you take it back first and then you fix it and it you know, returns to you completely. Taking it to the level that we've never seen before is what I've discussed, a level where we can start to have security in this country, electricity, infrastructure, have an education that is worth talking about, that is not dishing out ignorance, but knowledge. Uh, hospitals that can give you health and not sickness and the roads that are not killing people, you know, a country that can provide employment for steaming young population, a country that works for everybody, and most importantly, a Nigeria that is working for Africa, that is not a disgrace to the continent of Africa. Okay, share with us some of your blueprint strategy in well, making this happen, to jumpstart our economy, yes. first with like our GDP growth going down, well, and all of... Exactly, uh, you cannot have an economy in the first place uh, without having electricity. <laughs> And what we have decided to have a program of action in 10 places, we call it Spicer Hit. One is security. And you and I don't need to be told that, you know, 
without security, you can't have foreign investment, you can't have local investment. People can't go to sleep, they can't feel safe, they can't go to work and give their best. Uh, second is power, electricity. Without electricity, that's the basic, you know. Without electricity, electricity, you can't jumpstart anything, you can't manufacture, you can't sleep. Your children can't even do homework at night. So it affects everything. Infrastructure, without it as well, where people are connected, where goods can move from farm to the market, you can't have an economy. And of course, we have a problem of corruption in this country, and we'll fight it, but the way we are fighting is not the way I will fight it. How do you intend to tackle corruption? Well, we have to prevent people from stealing first and foremost. You don't make your resources available to be stolen and then you start running after people who have stolen it who already have connections with lawyers and judges and think you are going to make any headway. Even in the U.S. where I've lived for 19 years, they are more interested in preventing corruption as against recouping money because it costs them even legal, the legal cost of recovering a million dollars sometimes can be as much as 500,000, even more. That is why in fighting corruption in those places, they use it as a deterrent as opposed to using it as propaganda. Uh, and then you have an economy, like I mentioned, that is not working because the economy of Nigeria is designed by non-Nigerians and designed to work for non-Nigerians. That's why our best economies are always imported from the World Bank or the IMF. And we look at Nigeria, you talk about our economy, the way we describe it is look at foreign invest and um, foreign reserve. You cannot find any country in the world that is serious, that talks about the economy from the angle of foreign reserve. Ask yourself, where is the foreign reserve of the US? It's based in the US. Where is the foreign reserve of uh, the UK? It's based in the UK, but the foreign reserve of Nigeria is, big, is based at uh, the Bank of England and Chase and all of those are back. And what do they do with your foreign reserve? They invest them in building infrastructure in other places, whereas you are here boasting, you know, uh, with PowerPoint presentation about how well your economy is doing with foreign investment, I mean, foreign reserve, they are talking about how they can borrow from other places to build their own countries in, in terms of infrastructure, education, and these days, uh, these days, technology. So the other thing we want to do is restructuring. And people have asked me that question a lot. What's your position on restructuring? My position is not dictated and determined by the people who are making noise about restructuring. And we do respect that I'm not being disrespectful to people who are discussing it. But what I'm saying is that when we are discussing restructuring for Nigeria, I don't want an 80-year-old man to be the person speaking for me. Oh, because wow. they are already at the depart departure lounge of life. And they are the ones who failed this country in the first place. I don't want to mention names here. This should allow the young people of this country to restructure Nigeria for their own future. And I belong in that generation. I have been around for 29 years. I know most of the proponents of restructuring the country today, they are not interested in restructuring Nigeria. They are interested in dividing up whatever is left of Nigeria, sharing amongst themselves, and making some available for their own generations that are yet unborn. So for us to restructure Nigeria, we have to be in position of authority and power to make those decisions. Because as I'm sitting here today, if they call a restructuring meeting in Abuja tomorrow, they wouldn't even let me into the place. And we are, there are 70 70% of Nigerians that are in my position who are not invited to those uh, important decision-making meetings. So that's, that's, that's where we are. Then we go from there, we talk about health, education, agriculture, tourism. We call these things spicer heat. And all of them are equally important. But we will start, of course, with security because we have to secure this country. This country is one of the most insecure countries in the world. There are countries that are at war today where not many people get killed as they do in Nigeria. And Nigeria is said to be, you know, supposedly at I read the review of your campaign strategy. Yeah. Actually, the guy was comparing you, Feladro Toye, and some other young uh, presidential aspirants. Yes. And he was saying, look, you say the right things, yes. you know, but you are not talking to the right people. That usually, you know, your campaign is targeted at students, young people, um, and that many of those, you know, they just hail as if it's a students' union meeting. Do you think it's a fair criticism of your well, strategy? It's not, it's not fair, uh, but you understand that people are entitled to their opinion. If I'm running for office to become president of Nigeria, the first people I will go to will be 70 percent of the population whose future is at stake, who don't have employment, who don't have anything to show for being citizens in this country. The ones that have been disenfranchised, left behind, left in the cold, 
they are the ones we need to you know, clothe. They are the ones we need to provide jobs for. They are the ones we need to provide health for. Some of them have never seen anything good in their lifetime. I mean, I knew you in 1992, 93. And that's how many years ago? Those guys who were born between 92 when the military annulled the election in 93 and now haven't even seen any form of life that is comparable to what their, uh, what their colleagues are experiencing in Ghana or Togo or Benin Republic in some instances. So we have to go to those people first. And when we go to them, we have to talk to them and they have to react the way they want to react. So who are the rest of the people? The 1% of the private jet owners who will run out of Nigeria as soon as there's a little noise on the street. I'm not interested in those ones as, as much as those who have, who are 70% of our population who have been left in the cold, who have been left in the lodge. So that's where we go, and that's where I've always been. That's my constituency. That's the territory that we need to be to make this country work. So when people say that, you know, uh, you know, you, you're talking to people who are like student union. What is wrong with being students? Was it not on the back of students that we recovered our democracy that we have today? So why do we disparage young people simply because they don't talk the way we think they should be talking? You know, it's the same kind of elitism that brought us to the way we are now. That general, general disrespect for young people simply because they are young and they behave differently from the way we expect them to behave. There's nothing wrong with being young. Young people are the ones doing great things in this country. Young people are the ones behind the movie industry. They are the ones be behind the music industry. The, the only two things that's making Nigeria popular around the world, they are anchored by young people you know, in the entertainment industry. So what is wrong with being young? What is wrong with being creative? What's, been, what's wrong with being innovative? What's wrong with chanting you know, if you have been oppressed? What's wrong with protesting? Because, you know, every country in the world has experienced some kind of freedom, relied on young people to free them. So uh, it's, it's, it's not only unfair to say that, but I think it's also discriminatory. And, uh, you know, it's somehow very painful to hear people who are educated and enlightened just disparage young people the way they do. Well, I mean, you know the nature of politics in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. You yes. need money. That's right. And as publisher of Sahara Reporters, you practically quarrel with every big man in Nigeria. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, so who, is your, who are your godfathers? Who are your backers? I don't have godfathers. And I came you want to be president without a godfather? Absolutely. Without backers? No. I, you know, we have backers, but not godfathers. Okay. I want to be president to come and retire the godfathers in this country. It's wow. time for the godfathers. You think they will allow you? Well, they don't have to allow us, we have to disallow them. You know, so what are we doing? We're raising money publicly, we are crowdfunding, we are on GoFundMe, and you can contribute to our campaign, whatever you want, and we also have an account in Nigeria, people are donating to it. But what is most important is also to look at what is currency today. Uh, and when people want freedom, their currency will be different from paper money. And that's, that's where we stand. And we're seeing a lot of that, that with little money, uh, little support, we're getting far ahead of those who are spending billions so far. I have been to 28 states in Nigeria so far, and in those places, some places I had to take Okada, boats, you know, but the reception is amazing, you know, in places as far as Benikebi, Agungu, they're all looking to climb out of poverty. They are tired and sick of these very sick and tired leaders who are running the country. So. So the godfathers are all afraid. They're on their back hills and they're worried that, you know, there's a new sheriff in town who is campaigning differently, who is doing retail politics, and who is reaching out to people with no money. I don't have a private jet, uh, but I've been able to you, reach you far probably more get places. one as president of Nigeria. <laughs> well, I'll have, I'll, I'll have nine, but I'll sell eight of them. Okay. Yes. You have a very controversial online um, news agency. That's right. you, you're currently being sued um, uh, 10, billion, <laughs> 10 billion naira, yeah. correct? How do you think Nigerians will trust you um, if you know, you're just going against the odds all the time? If, if you're a newspaper uh, reporter and you don't get sued, you are not doing your job. That's the truth. And uh, I've been sued four times in the U.S. and I won all the cases because they couldn't reach the judges in the U.S. And one of the last person to sue me was Muslim uh, Obanikoro. And he went, he presented his case before a judge. And we presented our case before a judge in New York. The judge threw out the case. You know, but here, 
justice is sometimes for sale. And that's what they are relying upon, but that will not last forever. You know, I'm not new to those kind of controversies. I've been done Sahara reporters for 12 years. You know, they've done all kinds of things to me. I've been arrested, attacked, and I'm sure more will come. You know, but there's no journalist worth his, uh, uh, worth his uh, so. thoughts who will be out there afraid of a libel lawsuit. You know, I mean, that's what you do to journalists when they say things you don't like. You go to court and sue them. And we'll but, prove that in court. But isn't, also, so isn't there also something about your style of activism? For example, recently there was uh, something trending yes. on social media. You attended an event uh -huh. in the U.S., mm -hmm. and then a certain minister from yes. Nigeria supposedly came late, mm -hmm. and then you took over the event and started saying this is unacceptable. A minister cannot uh, come late to an event. If you do this in Nigeria, don't come and do it here. Who is this uh, particular minister, and what was the event about? Well, this was actually... 2012. Oh, okay, not it now. Was, it wasn't okay. now. Was yes. So many of these things are trending now because I'm running. Yes. And most people have never seen some of these clips of, okay. uh, uh, of my activism before. It was a minister for uh, minister of state for foreign affairs. I think it was uh, Omuliri. Okay. And it was during the occupied Nigeria. Yes. And a guy had just been shot and killed on the streets of Lagos for protesting peacefully. Quite a few people, actually. And she then came to have a town hall meeting in New York. And while we were waiting for her, word came that she was coming late to the meeting because she was changing her room upstairs in the same hotel. She complained to the hotel, I mean, the hotel that her room was too small. So they were moving her to a bigger suite. And we were there waiting for hours. And then when she eventually came, no apologies. But that wasn't the reason why we shut down the town home. And that was just one of the reasons we shut it. We were there to shut it down because we didn't want them to come and insult us having killed peaceful protesters in Nigeria. So, but those are one of the lines of, or strings of, you know, uh, protests that have been backed upon. You also remember during Yaradua's time, uh, late former minister Ujuma Dweke came to the U.S. And he was telling us at the United Nations that Nigeria don't need the president that is physically present in Nigeria. I had to also shut him down. So I've done several of those kind of meetings to the point that at a point no Nigerian officials like to come to New York because they knew I would be there to fight them. I used to also lead a group of uh, young people in the U.S. to fight against governors who will leave Nigeria on Independence Day to go and celebrate it in New York. So several, or several occasions we had to go there and shut down those meetings because we say this is not U.S. independence, this is Nigeria's independence. You stay at home and do independence. Don't bring your aides and, you know, uh, uh, you know, and cultural followers to New York to come and waste funds. At a point, seven governors were in New York for Nigeria's Independence Day. But when it got to a point where we had to shut it down finally, they stopped coming. So those are so many, those are one of the things that I, I used to do. My activism never stopped. Newspaper reporting or web news reporting never stopped me as an activist. And I still do it today. You know, even when I was in Abuja um, a few weeks ago, and the secretary, the executive secretary of uh, NHIS was playing with his phone at a public event, I had to, I had to call him to order. Uh, you know, you cannot be executive secretary at a head seminar that has future president of Nigeria, or likely future president of Nigeria discussing. He had his cell phone, airpiece, airport, inserted in one ear, and he was fiddling with his phone in public. So when it comes to taking on the system, I don't shy away from it. And I will continue even as president when I win next year. You are a job from on those stage. That's correct. We just had, yes, we just had an job president. Do you think the way politics, the way it goes in Nigeria, yes. that Nigerians will be ready to vote for another job no, president? No, you know, this whole zoning argument is lazy man's, you know, approach to politics. But isn't that where we are in Nigeria today? We are not there. You know, this is where they took us. <laughs> and we have a duty to move away from any of those things that have kept us down and in the dark. We see, the job president of Nigeria is not Nigeria's president. It just happened to be an job man who was imposed on Nigeria by people who, was, who had been zoning Nigeria to themselves. But the interesting thing is that young people out there are not asking me, you know, the size of the tribal mark on my face. They are asking me my character, you know, my competence, and what I'm willing to do for Nigeria when I become president. I like the fact that we've reached that point where people are discussing real issues 
and are just discussing your ethnicity or your religion or how tall you are or how old, you know. And of course, we are discussing how old we are now because old people are the ones who run Nigeria aground. So, and of course, when we've had old people, we find out that we're spending more money keeping them in hospital than keeping them in office. So that old person's argument is also very important. You know, the argument about competence, I think, is the overriding factor now. So until today, I don't discuss where I come from. In fact, most people don't know where I come from. Some people said, you know, Shore Zijebu. The Minister of uh, Communication said I'm from Ife when I had an argument with him on, in a radio station. That. Yes. So they don't know where I come from because I've never presented myself to anybody as an ethnic champion. And I don't want to be an ethnic champion. I want to be a human being who has respect for people based on their citizenship and their dignity, not where they come from, you know, where, not where they, they face when they pray. Uh, yeah. I recall that your, uh, should I say, quarrel or, <laughs> or controversy with the uh, Minister of Communications. Yes. Uh, he was saying in that interview, if I recall, that you shouldn't be talking about the becoming president. I should go and start at the level of local government chairman. Yes. And some people also express such sentiments yes. that young people should go and learn and acquire some experience before they say they want to run Nigeria. Yeah. A lot of politicians when you that. talk about experience, what is experience? After 29 years as, a, as an activist, you know, as a... But it's not the same thing as running a government. No, this, who is running a government here? These are people who are doing trial and error. With all their experience, where has Nigeria been? We've had two former presidents become president, you know, again, Obasanjo and now Buhari. Ask yourself, where did they take you with that experience? They took Nigeria from a country that used to be terrible to become a country that is the worst almost in the world. So that kind of experience is not the experience that we need because that is not experience. It's just old age masked as experience or, you know, bureaucrats who have been around for a long time who claim that being a bureaucrat qualifies you to be an experienced person. Sometimes, you know, experience is about what you've seen in life, it's about what you've done, it's about what you are capable of doing based on your history and pedigree. These guys have none of that. I have that. The democracy that we're enjoying today in this country, I worked with several other people, young people, to fight for it. The media, you know, that we're talking about today, I have experience in it. I've been an entrepreneur as well, even though I don't like to put that out there, you know. I have fought for this country. I have 29 years of consistency fighting for what is right. What better experience is that? The, the other experience the other people have is stealing, assassination, and killing people. Okay, what do you yeah. intend to do differently? Mm -hmm. How do you turn around the economy? What are the things you will change? Yeah. So I come from not only a tradition of understanding what makes things work, but I've actually worked and been exposed to how things work in several other places. And as I mentioned earlier, the economy of Nigeria would not work until we have the capability to run Nigeria the way other places are run. For example, electricity. And when you're talking about electricity, you cannot just be relying on gas because that's coming from one place that is troubled. We've got sunshine these days, solar, and nobody's talking about it. You know, and we can generate easily 4,500 megawatts of electricity within two years. The same way Morocco is doing. I think it was Angela Merkel, the, uh, the German the Chancellor, German Chancellor yes. you know, or as President Buhari would like to describe her, the former, the president of uh, Western Germany, who came here and was talking about solar energy. Yeah. Right. The same way I've been talking about it. Because why? Morocco is going to be selling solar to France, and I think Malta. The same. We are in the same area. You know, we are in the same region of the world where you get almost free sunshine. And nobody's talking about it here. Even with our gas pipeline, there are over 9.5 billion cubic feet of gas still in Ogoni land. But if you don't clean up Ogoni land, you can't go there and ask for gas. Okay. Right? So you have to restore peace and justice to the Niger Delta region. This is where I come from. And there are several other ways and means of generating electricity. We'll do that differently. And if you have electricity 24-7 in Nigeria, the economy will grow from whatever it is today to a percentage that economies should be struggling to describe how it came to that. Because why? Nigerians are innovative people. 
and most of them are already moved on from looking for government jobs to setting up their own little ways of doing business in such a way that if we can only give them a jump start with electricity, you will be surprised at what will happen. You know, unlike your former guest here, I'm not going to build a, you know, a mall in somewhere that you know you can't find electricity to run it and you can't find a road to run to the place. And then you build the mall 10 years after, there's no one single bodega there. I would have invested that money in electricity. I would have invested it in road infrastructure. Build road first before you buy a nice car. That's okay, take us down your first 100 yes. days in office and if you, you become see, 100. When we talk about 100 days, yeah. we are repeating the same cliches of people who are ineffective. Okay. Why do you have to wait for 100 days before okay, you start working? We start, wo Tell us we start working from the first day we reach office. Okay. That's what we are elected to do. Nobody's waiting for 10 days. You've you know, 10 days in the life of people who are sick will mean a lot of people will die. Mm. We'll hit the ground running. Okay, and I've described to you that every project that we we'll describe to you, for example, we need to set up our cabinet effects in not six months. That, why, that was why the Nigerian economy you have to went into the cabinet. This current cabinet, all yes. of them are leaving as soon as we come into office. Nobody will be left. Sure, will be in the place. You were a member of a group called yes. the Presidential Aspirants Coming Together. I wasn't. Packed. I wasn't. I was never part of well, your name was mentioned. It was said you were one of I attended one meeting of the group. But your name was on the list of persons considered as no, consensus no. candidate no, and no. fell out through to a one. It couldn't have happened. You know, let's get this right. I pulled out after the first meeting. So my name couldn't have been part of people. This is part of the lies they told just to buff up whatever the decision they took. I was never part of PACT. I told them, and talk about Fasho, I wrote exactly what happened, you know, in premium times about what exactly happened. That it was on this program yes. too, yesterday. When I got there, I said I am not going to be part of any coalition. I came here to talk to you guys to see if we can present a unified front. So there was nothing beyond that first meeting. They had several other meetings. They invited me again. I said I'm not part of it. I never even signed the release that they had on that first day. So they listed my name as one of the attendees and maybe they kept putting my name out there, but I never participated in PAC. So whatever came out of PAC, I had no hand in it, I had no interest in it, and I made it very clear. I actually issued an advisory through Take It Back uh, movement, saying this is our position uh, on PAC. So it's not true that I was part of PAC. Well, what structures do you have on the ground to realize this your ambition? I mean, you are running on the platform of a party that is relatively very new, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, because we have to start on a clean slate. So what structures do you have? Parties. We, we already have structures. Before you could be registered as a party in Nigeria, you have to have structures in at least 24 to 26 states of the federation. That is taken care of. And since we registered, which is about, I mean, since we were announced as a party, which is about, um, I think about three, four weeks ago, we have expanded so rapidly that is unbelievable. We are in all the states of the Federation as we speak, and we are expanding to local governments and also to world levels across the country. And we are planning to participate, for example, in Ondo State in the local government elections. Well, I mean, but that means structure. I, I, at, at well, I ask that question because yeah. it comes across like a one man party. No, it's not. You, you are the only one, you know, everybody gets to hear about us. You know, the founder to, of the party, the presidential they, aspirant, and they all used, of that. They, they used to say that Sahara Reporters was a one-man media company, but it wasn't. It was a media movement. So it happens that when you have such parties, there will be an arrowhead, of course, and most people like to focus on me than focus on the party, which is good for the party because it then allows the party to work on hinder and underground. So I'm not the arrowhead. I'm the moving target. Well, if you go into the election and um, perchance you don't win, uh, what, what will you do thereafter? If we, if we don't win this election, it will be that we didn't want to win it. Because this is the best time in Nigeria to defeat the old guys. But if it happens that we don't win, we have done something that has never been done before, which is to disrupt the political space in such a way that it will expand the democratic space for people who otherwise never even consider themselves worthy to participate within our political process. And you know, more and more of these people will be emboldened. But I don't see how we lose this because, you know, as you see, the old political guys are in disarray. That is not to say that they will not unite because they are after the national cake. So, but we are moving so fast and galvanizing support uh, that 
I believe that people will get to a point where they'll say, you know, uh, push will come to shove. Well, let me ask you a personal question. Go ahead. When I was in government yeah. and I was presidential spokesman, yes. you made my work so difficult. <laughs> I mean, you gave my office real hell. Yeah. Uh, you know, I used to call you and yeah. you used to, you know, tell me, don't worry, I'm doing my work. Right. But you've been very lenient with the Buhari administration. It's actually not true. No, I mean, I, mean, I read the Sahara reporters and yeah. I was wondering whether the leniency is because you are running for president. No, I, you know, so maybe you could say that since i started running for president which meant that i didn't participate in sahara as i used to uh it would it could have you know people will have different opinion because like i said it's just like you think of the party say she is there like i'm the moving target and people the moment i said i'm running for office a lot of people also take their eyes off the ball uh and that's generally our self could affect how the view decide uh, the content of the site because there are people who used to be in government uh, who talk to me directly who don't want to talk to the other people because they don't know them or maybe they want to talk to me and they can't find me you know the way we used to get information but being lenient on the government is not correct you know i think we've been so hard on this government that at a point we've been labeled everything by this government you know including unlike yourself you talk to me and i have to say this online regardless of what i wrote i could reach you you would respond. But uh, with the current uh, media managers of this president, they have no tolerance for people like me. You know, they, I don't think it took more than two months before Femi Adishino stopped talking to me. It's like, you are a lost case. We don't have it. There's no way to talk to you to make you understand how government operates. You know? And I know how government operates. Sheikh Gwandini was also really uh, nice during his time. And I think I made even his own job more held than yours because. Oh. Yes, because he was dealing with Yaradua at that time, and Yaradua, they had a lot more to cover up under Yaradua because he was sick and they wanted to present him as, a, as someone who was healthy than your own time. But this same government has had more health than uh, you can even imagine. Don't forget that we broke a lot of stories uh, under this government, including you know what's happening with Boko Haram, what's happening with military generals who were buy houses in Dubai, you know, the back-ended, uh, you know, illegal hiring at the central bank. You know, I, I can't tell you how many stories we've done under this government, including even the health of the president, how, you know, they try to cover it up. We were the ones who broke the story that he would spend four months abroad, whereas they lied about it so, uh, for so long until it became clear that uh, they had to take the president away for, for so long. So there's been so many stories broken under this government including, you know, what they did with MTN fines, you know all the stories. So we've been very hard on them. Uh, and, uh, but the hardest thing to do to them is to take them out completely next year. You've been in online journalism for yes. about 12 years. Yes. And you've been very critical of the local Nigerian media. Yes. Now going around, interacting with the media and using the local platform uh, at home yes. and seeing, you know, interacting at closer quarters. Has your opinion about the local media changed? No, it, the question is, has, you know, is to ask if their opinion about me has changed, and I think it hasn't. I think we, they got to a point where they saw me as an enemy uh, because you know, they just felt like, one, they thought that I came as a great crasher uh, into the media uh, world, and secondly, there were a lot of people they didn't like to touch that I was touching, and sometimes when I would do breaking stories or write investigative reports, it's first people to call me would be journalists. And I'll be wondering, so if you had this story, would you not do it? So discovered a lot of journalists were working on behalf of uh, people in government. Uh, and today, I think they are taking it out on me. They don't like reporting on my activities a lot. So I'm doing it all over again, reporting myself. Well, but they did the same thing to Dele Momodu when he ran in, uh, was it uh, 19, 2003 or so? Well, I, I don't think, you know, to be fair to Dele Momodu and to be fair to, you know, our different campaigns, Dele, Dele didn't run the way we are running now. Like, you know, I, I followed him during that period, too. And I remember no, the, that... The point I'm making is that he too complained that, you know, his biggest uh, critics and enemies were his own colleagues, journalists, yeah, I, who I, didn't want to report him. I, I think the issue that I found out to be uh, unpalatable about media in Nigeria is that there's a whole lot of monetization of media. So if you are not willing to give, they will tell you outright. If you don't have money to give us, you are not getting your case, you are not getting your issue reported. I remember in Abuja, you know, I had a number of journalists with us. 
uh, who came to cover the opening of the party. After they finished, they didn't leave. And I had to go to them. Why are you still hanging around? They said, well, you have to give us money if you want this. No, they were waiting for the communiqua. Yeah, not communiqua. <laughs> they were waiting. <laughs> no, that's what it is called. <laughs> Commu it's, called it's not called communiqua. Okay. It's called communiqua. <laughs> oh, OK. So I was shocked. I went to them and said, they said, you have to make some provision for us to get this thing yes, reported tomorrow uh, if you want to see. And some of them were even you know, reporters of international media houses. I was shocked. And I told them I have nothing to give them. And some of them reported, some of them got angry and said, look, so one of them threw my, you know, uh, my paper back at me. They said, look, forget about this, your presidential aspirant, if you don't have communique. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been a great pleasure having you here. I wish you success in your um, political ambition. Thank you so much for, right. for having well, me. Well, Thank I you. hope to see you as president soon. <laughs> <laughs>